Well, good morning, Peninsula Community Church. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Um, as you may have noticed, Pastor Jim is away, um, and so I'm going to be filling in. My name is Andrew. I'm the student ministry pastor here at Peninsula Community Church. And I thought I'd start today off with a question, and it's something that I have been uh, thinking about for a long time as someone who uh, works with students. And this question is, what does influence look like today? What does influence look like today? And part of the reason I ask this question, not only is Mother's Day, and hopefully there's some influence there, but also because um, uh, my mind wanders to who has influence. Who has influence today? And when we look around, we kind of see, well, okay, there's, there's this new age social media influence, right, where people's jobs are literally to influence others online. So, okay, okay, those people have some influence. Uh, we, we got celebrities have influence, politicians have influence. Uh, um, perhaps, you know, you think of like someone like Elon Musk, someone super wealthy and power, they have influence. And we're kind of noticing a trend. We're kind of getting this idea, you got to be super loud, you got to be super powerful, there's something uh, you, you kind of need to have this influence, and it, it makes me wonder, is that what it should be like? Is that, is that what influence should be like? Just a few years ago, uh, a Time magazine put together this top 100 most influential people of all time, and to the, uh, the incorrect guess of my daughter-in-law, uh, Charlie D'Amelio is not number one. Um, and so there's this list, the top most uh, influential people uh, of all time, and um, coming in at number one, which shouldn't surprise us since we're in church, was Jesus. To a sense, though, that was a little shocking, because this is Time magazine. It's not like Christianity Today, right? Christianity Today, you're like, okay, I mean, come on, you got to put them number one, otherwise it's kind of weird. But it was Time magazine put it number one. So it's a little shocking, but, but I think the more we began to think about it, it's like, okay, actually, that makes sense. Because whether you're a Christian, we're in church and we're celebrating Jesus, and so it's like, yeah, that makes sense to us, amen, right? Um, or you're not a Christian, I think you can still see that Jesus had profound impact and profound influence. I'll give you an example. If I were to say the phrase, everybody's favorite holiday is, you're saying Christmas, right? That even if it's not your favorite holiday, that's probably still the first one that came to mind, right? You're saying Christmas. Okay, so uh, even if you're not a Christian, maybe your favorite holiday is Christmas, a, a day where we're literally celebrating Jesus's birth. Or if I say, okay, uh, what year is it? They say 2022, right? It's 2022 AD though. So literally our calendar is split from the time before Jesus' birth and the time after Jesus' birth. And so whether we're in church or not, it, it, you can't deny Jesus had influence. It, it makes sense he's number one, right? It makes sense he's up there. And so the question for us today as his followers should then be, okay, if we want to have influence, if we want to have impact, and we should, then shouldn't we go back to him? For our, for our example, right? So, so I, I think what we see is that his influence, compared to the people that have influence today, was deeper, was richer, and clearly longer lasting. So in a sense, how did he do it? How did he make that happen? And, and that leads us to our big idea for today. So our big idea today, if you're following along with your notes, kind of what we're, we're looking at today is a, a, a truly impactful life is one of a zoomed lens, or zoom lenses. Ooh, there you go. My mic was falling. Uh, a truly impactful life is one of Zoom lenses. Now, if you are a, a camera person, maybe you're an Instagram person, or maybe you're like old school camera person, um, and, and you, you love videos or, or photography or something like that, hopefully this connects with you right away. But for those of you who aren't, let me explain what I mean. I have two pictures, and I want to show them real quick. So you can go ahead and throw picture number one up. We have two pictures. They're very, they're, they're just standard pictures. You don't have to go too, too into it. But look, we're going to notice uh, real quick just the difference between the two pictures. And again, they're just from like iPhoto or iStock or something like that. So don't, don't go too conspiracy theory on me. But we've got these two different pictures. And in these two different pictures, I think we see two very different things happening. 
um, right? And, and the first one, there's this crowd. It, it's it's a, a wide shot. You're showing the crowd. You're, you're showing, in a sense, the background. You're showing a, a scene that's going on. But then in picture number two, you're zooming in on one person. Now, there's other people still there. You can kind of see that, but you see the focus and the zoom is up close, up front on one person. And so this is kind of what we're looking at with this idea, right, of a zoom lens. Uh, a truly impactful life is one of zoom lens. And I think we see this at work with Jesus, right? And so if we're learning from his example, I think one thing we can learn about influence is that uh, influence doesn't come, a truly impactful influence, the influence that Jesus had, it, it doesn't come with one super witty, well thought out Twitter post. Uh, it doesn't come with one heroic action. It doesn't come with one political candidate. It comes on a much more personal level. So if you're following along, here's where we're going to start to get in a little bit more. Point number two for you is this. Jesus did life with a zoomed lens. Jesus did life with a zoom lens. Remember, we're, we're taking him as the example. We're not just one, we don't want to just pull this out of thin air and say, here's what we're doing. We're taking Jesus as our example. And so uh, an author, his name's Kyle Eidelman, he, was, uh, he wrote a book called not a, not a Fan, and so he's talking about how to become more than just a fan of Christianity, how to take it into a serious level. But he writes this about Jesus and his impact and how he was able to zoom into people. He said, uh, when someone stood in front of Jesus time stopped. Everything else in his life, all of his concerns, all of his agendas, all of his plans or goals, his schedule for the day seemed to pause. Everything else seemed to blur into the background. The only thing that mattered was the person standing in front of him. And that phrase right there, the only thing that mattered was the person standing in front of him, this, this idea of blurring stuff into the background, that's kind of what I want to look at today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Luke chapter 8. If you don't, um, don't worry, the text will be on the screen in just a second. Uh, but as you do, turn to Luke chapter 8 because uh, I want to look at this uh, story where Jesus is going to have this uh, immense impact on someone. But it's interesting because it's a moment where he zooms in and everything else blurs. And so if you're there, it's going to be Luke 8, and we're going to start in um, verse 40. So let's go Luke 8 verse 40, and um, just for context purposes, right before this, uh, Jesus is, uh, has this uh, pretty well-known moment where he casts out a demon. It's named Legion, and it's this moment he casts out Legion, and it goes into these pigs, and the pigs go run away, and, and they, they're like, I don't want this. They jump into a river, basically. So there's like this crazy story, and then it says Jesus comes back, and he's changing locations, and when he changes locations, now we kind of see where our moment picks up. Verse 40, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Just then there came a man named Jairus, a leader of the synagogue. He fell at Jesus' feet and he begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter about 12 years old who was dying. And he, that's Jesus, went, the crowd pressed in on him, now, there was a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for about 12 years, and though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. We're going to pause right there. So just the first half, looking in, kind of getting a setting. Okay, so the story picks up. Jesus just has returned, right? He came back from this moment, and um, as he does, there's a crowd. A crowd is filled in. I think at this point in time, that's, that's, not nothing, that's, that's nothing new for Jesus, right? It's, it, it's kind of standard practice. Where he goes, there's a crowd. And I think the passage makes it clear, like, this crowd's not necessarily there for the, at least doesn't have the best heart for being there, right? They're there because they want something. They're there because they want something from him. They, they either want to be healed, um, or, or they, they want to receive something, or, or perhaps they just want to, like, see something amazing, right? It makes me think of, um, I don't know if you've ever seen The Incredibles from Pixar, and there's that, that scene where there's a little kid on the trike, and he's rolling by Mr. Incredible's house, and he stops, and he just, like, waits, and he's like, Mr. Incredible's like, what are you doing? Like, why are you here? And he's like, I just want to see something amazing. I want to see you rip the car door handle off again. Like, I'm here to see something amazing. 
And there's this instance that this is kind of the heart of the crowd. But we see someone stands out from the crowd. It says his name is, is Jairus. Um, he's, a, he's the leader of the synagogue. And I think it's interesting because I think there's a sense where Jairus, he stands out um, almost because the crowd makes him stand out. Right? He, he's, almost, he's almost in the front because the crowd makes him stand out in the front. He um, says he's the leader of the synagogue. Um, so he would, he would organize the synagogue meetings. He would like plan the services. And he would, he would be in charge of the elders, the council of elders. What that tells us is that this was someone important. This is someone like in today's world who we, you know, maybe if we change the context a little bit, they would still have influence. They would still say, we would say, that's someone important. And they, they kind of treated them as such. They would say, this is someone important. This might be someone who has money. This might be someone who has power. Um, this is someone who fit in. This was someone who, who, who meant something. And so he, he's, he's pushed the crowd. And, and it, what's interesting is um, a lot of times when we look at this story, I think we look at the, the, the two side characters involved and, and we look at their faith and it is amazing. And I think you see something with Jairus here, but I, I, I want that to kind of play second fiddle. I think I want it to play second fiddle to what Jesus does because what we see here is we do see um, it's interesting the way Jairus talks to Jesus. Normally when Jesus is having like a, a confrontation with a, a, someone like a synagogue leader, a religious leader, it doesn't really go the best way. Right? They're, they're usually there to trap him or to trick him or to make him say something or to, or to kind of cause tension. They want, they want problems. But we see that's not the case here. It's especially interesting concerning where Jesus had just come from. Jesus had just come from demon and pig country. And now the first person he interacts with is this religious leader. Someone who's probably picky with the kind of company they keep. Someone who would probably wonder, um, Jesus, are you really clean? Like, can I be around you? Is it okay for me to be around you? But we see he, he, doesn't, he doesn't have that attitude. As one commentary uh, writer put it, he, he's not wondering if everything's kosher in the moment. <laughs> right? He's, he, he's worried about something more, and that's when we see he's desperate. His only daughter, 12 years old, was dying. Again, I think a lot of times we focus on the faith of these people, and, and I do think it's important, but again, let that play second fiddle to the way Jesus responds to him. We see he's desperate. We see he, he's someone who probably wouldn't get along with Jesus all the time. But he comes to him, and Jesus responds to his desperation. He goes with him. He goes with him. He says, all right, I'm, I'm going to come with you. At that point in town, uh, the crowd was pressed in on him. So again, there's this crowd and it's pressing in on him. And it, it seems like the crowd became an obstacle. It seems like the crowd became a problem. Um, I want you to, 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 uh, to get, in order for us to get this setting, I want you to, like, in a sense, imagine when was a time you were trying to fight through a crowd to get somewhere? Maybe it was uh, like Disneyland, you know, Main Street during the parade. And you're like, there are so many people around and you have to, you have to like, squeeze your way through, or it's your high school hallways, and you had to squeeze your way through. When was the time you had to uh, fight your way through a crowd to kind of get this setting? There's so many people around them. I was thinking about it, and um, the time I experienced the biggest crowd ever, that was just completely overwhelming for me, uh, was in my last year in college. Um, for you who don't know, my, I went to a college in Chicago um, at a Moody Bible Institute there. It's in downtown Chicago. And I tried to really get into the whole, like, Chicago thing while I was there. And my last year there was 2016. If you know anything about Chicago history, and Dick McLennan will tell you, 2016 was a big year for Chicago. It was a big year. And the reason it was such a big year was because the Cubs, Chicago Cubs, broke their over 100-year curse to finally win the World Series. The first time in a, over 100 years, I think it's 108 years, they won the World Series. And so in the midst of this World Series, there's this frenzy about the city. Everyone is talking about it. Everyone cares. Even the haters, they all care. They're all talking about it, right? Everyone's in on it. 
And the series, it, it goes down to the wire. It, it goes to game seven, which means it's winner take all. And when game seven comes, my friends and I are talking and we're like, you know what? We've been here for four years. Like, we've been a part of this city. Like, let's like fully go into it. Let's feel the culture of the city. Let's go with it. And so um, after taking the necessary precautions, we decide we're going to go down to the stadium <laughs> and we're going to join in the crowds. We're going to join the crowds and win or lose, we're going to just feel everything the city's feeling. For the record, we didn't actually take any of that stuff down there, though the frying pan probably would have came in handy because uh, it, was, it was a madhouse. And so we go down there and um, we go down to the stadium and now Chicago is a little different than like Dodger Stadium. It, the, the stadium's not up on a hill. There's not a giant parking lot. It's not separated from everyone. It's in the heart of the city. It's in the heart of the city. You can walk from a, a restaurant to inside the stadium in maybe a minute. It's that close to everything. And so we get down there and we notice that all the restaurants are filled. All the stores are filled. And it's overflowing onto the streets. And it's not just like overflowing where there's like a long line. It's like packed. It's shoulder to shoulder packed. Everyone's like trying to watch the game through the window of a restaurant. It's, it's, you can't move. We were, we were just standing there trying to enjoy it, but we're, we're packed in there. It's game seven. It's winner takes all. The, the game's back and forth. It, it goes to extra innings to add to the excitement. All of a sudden, the top of the ninth, the Cubs take the lead, or top of the tenth. Cubs take the lead. They're three outs away from winning the World Series. More people flood in. They're two outs away from winning the World Series. More people flood in. Now they're one out away from winning the World Series. You can feel all these people coming in. And then you have this moment. <laughs> If you notice, the video ends with me getting pushed down. So, <laughs> that's how tight it was. We're f they're, they're, it's not just a crowd, it's a frenzied crowd. They're going crazy. And so I want you to, I want you to picture this with the story of Jesus. Him, him and, and Jairus are, are pushing their way through the crowd, but they're, they're, they're tightly packed in, and, and it's, it's a crowd with energy. It's a crowd with, with excitement. They're, they're feeling this moment, right? They're all around Jesus. And so it... it it's a little surprising then what happens next because as, as he's moving through we enter in this character. This character enters in this one character who enters in in the midst of the crowd and this is the person we really want to focus in on today. And if you uh, have been around at any time you probably know where we're going because you've seen the painting um, out in our lobby, but this is where we're going in, where this character in the midst of this frenzy crowd comes in. Verse 44. She came behind him and touched the fringe of his clothes, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. When Jesus asked, who touched me? All denied it. Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounds you and is pressed in on you. Right? What kind of question is that? What do you mean who touched you? There's like, we're surprised you didn't get knocked down to the ground like me. He says, but Jesus says, someone touched me for I noticed that power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came up trembling. Falling down before him, she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been healed immediately. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well go in peace. I think it's interesting because uh, we, we get this now story, we get this entrance of this character, um, and, and in the midst of the crowd, Jesus stops, right, and he's asking, who touched me? And it, 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 if we've seen the story, we kind of know like what's going on because it, it, it's a special kind of a contact that happens, right? And a lot of times, again, we zoom in on the, the, these uh, other characters, and we're like, okay, well, probably a lot of people bumped up against Jesus, but what's interesting is this is the only one that gets written down about something happening. So there must be something special here, right? This woman's touch might, must have been different than theirs for some reason, right? And we like to look at her faith and her desperation. Um, and I think that's, 
that's a good place to start, right? Because we saw that the woman is suffering. It says the woman is suffering. I think suffering is a, a good word to use for her. The woman is suffering. It's a, that's a good word to describe her. Uh, some translations say that she had been bleeding for 12 years. She had a hemorrhage. She's bleeding for 12 years. I don't know for sure, but that sounds like an innuendo to me. And so there's a, there's a sense of suffering. And she's not just suffering physically. I mean, she's bleeding for 12 years. She's suffering emotionally and spiritually and mentally as well. Uh, because she was bleeding, um, she was cere- ceremonially unclean. She was ceremonially unclean. And uh, if you don't know, that was really big for them. Like, it was really big in the Jewish culture. And while you're ceremonially unclean, there are certain things you can't do, that people to be around um, until you go through the process of becoming clean again. The problem is she can't go through that process. She can't go through that process if the bleeding doesn't stop. So she's just stuck in this never-ending state of being unclean. And what's worse is, uh, since she's unclean, she's like a carrier for uncleanliness, too. She's like a transmitter. So if she came into contact with you, now you're unclean, too. And so people didn't want to be around her. People didn't want to be around her. If she's unclean and she touched you, you're unclean. And so I think this woman's suffering, not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually, mentally. She's pushed to the fringes of society. She's pushed to the background. She's pushed away from people, right? She can't be around people. I'll just say it plainly. She can't have sex. So if she's married, uh, she's probably not married anymore. It's 12 years. She can't be around people. And what, what, I think what maybe is even worse is she can't worship the same way everyone else can. She's unclean. She can't go into the synagogue the way everyone else can. And so I think she's suffering because she felt alone. She felt, felt alone. She couldn't be around people. She felt far from people. She felt far from God. And so she has this idea to come up, and she thinks, okay, if I can... If I can just sneak in and just touch Jesus, just touch him in some way, I, that will heal me. And again, we like to, we like to focus in um, on this character and, and, and again, her faith and, and the idea of where she can sneak in and, and her idea is, oh, if I just touch him, that'll be enough. And I think that's good. But for today, what I want to look at, point number three is this. When Jesus zooms into you, everything else blurs into the background when jesus zooms into you everything else blurs into the background so we look at this idea often of her and her faith and how she's healed but we don't always look at jesus and how he responds to her right he's asking this question who touched me what do you mean who touched me everyone probably did but he's he's being intentional with this moment right i like verse 47 because it says then the woman seeing that she could not go unseen seeing that she couldn't go unnoticed. For 12 years, she had lived in the background. She had lived uh, unnoticed, unseen, hidden. And she figured she could do the same in this moment. But Jesus doesn't let her. Jesus doesn't let her sneak in, sneak out. He doesn't let her stay in the background. And I think it's interesting... um, you see the way she responds when she gets called out, right? He says, who touched me? It says, well, when, when the woman seeing that she couldn't go unnoticed, she comes trembling. She comes worried. I love that because I think that's a, the way a lot of us respond when we're, when we're hiding on the fringes with God, when we're staying distant, right? She thinks she's being called uh, almost like to the principal's office, Right? She thinks God, like, she's being called because she did something she wasn't supposed to do. Right? She's a transmitter of uncleanliness. She probably wasn't supposed to touch him, and maybe she's thinking, okay, I can't go unnoticed. Everyone's going to know now. I'm going to get in trouble. I finally got what I wanted. And right when I got it, now I'm in trouble. 
But that's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus isn't calling her into focus to condemn her or to punish her. He's calling her into focus to encourage her. I think she was uh, uh, worried that he's going to bring down the hammer. Like when he focuses in on her, he's going to bring down the hammer, but that's not his idea. He responds with just the, this word daughter. Like the way he responds to her is daughter. I feel like all the tension just released in that moment. Coming up to him worried, just I'm probably shaking and has to explain to everyone what she did and why she did it. And he just responds in gentleness, daughter. It's like an exhale. I like this too. Like I said, I think this fits well for us still today and and our idea of um, sometimes I think either in times of life, we, we like to kind of hide in the background still, right? We like to, to, to come into church and find a, find a spot in the back we can kind of sit and then kind of leave during the last song. We don't have to talk to anyone. We can kind of get in and get our Jesus and, and, and leave. And, and, and the idea behind it is there's safety in the background. There's peace in the background. If, if I'm getting zoomed in on, that's scary. And this idea of God zooming in on us is scary, it's like God, you know, God has other things to worry about. If he's starting to look at me, I don't, um, I don't need that like God. And I can tell you I've thought that myself too. It's like, like, I don't want you to focus in on me. Like, then you're going to see all the bad things I do, right? And there's this idea where the, the bringing down the hammer kind of element of, of we're worried that God's going to zoom in on us there. And we feel safer when we're far away. But it's interesting, I don't think peace, as we see in this passage, uh, is found in the background, right? It's not found in the background, it's found in the zoomed-in lens. If you have your Bibles, you can turn real quick uh, just to number six, be in Numbers uh, chapter six, and um, just to add some context for where where we are, I think number six is great because a lot of times we use this verse as a, a benediction. It'll be on the screen, too, hopefully. Hopefully I sent that. Okay. Um, number six, uh, we, we get this, really we use it often as a benediction, right? This blessing that, we, that someone will come up and they'll read it to the whole congregation. But I think within it, we see kind of this zoomed-in element of when God zooms in on you, everything else blurs into the background. And so number six, starting in 22, uh, this is what the Lord says to Moses. He says, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Verse 26, right? The Lord turn your, his face towards you and give you peace it's this idea again right the zooming in it's not to condemn uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't to take away what she finally had it was to encourage her it was it was to bring her closer uh, i think uh, oftentimes uh the, especially like in what we're seeing in numbers uh the face of god is also representing his relational presence and um I was thinking about it, and uh, have, have any of you ever been to the restaurant North Italia? You ever been to North Italia? It's at the point, yes, my wife is raising her hand. Uh, I'm glad you're raising your hand, because you're, uh, what I was going to say is, uh, Katie and I really like North Italia. Um, we, love, we love going there. That's like a, one of our favorite date night spots. Um, and it's not just because the food's amazing, but it's also because of what happens when we're there. And so we go to North Italia, and it's often packed, and the point is packed, and it's, it's crazy, and we usually get, because uh, there's two of us, shoved into this little table, basically in the middle of everyone. Uh, right? There's a lot of distractions all over. There's TVs playing and, and chaos all around us, and usually little kids running around the point. But we like North Italia because we have a time to connect. Right, we have a time to connect together. Um, there's this idea 
where when we're there right her face is turned towards me and my face is turned towards her right and so it, it's like when we're sitting there at this table right i, I had brian sit here for a reason <laughs> I lived with him, and I figured he could handle the, uh, the weird awkwardness, right? There's this moment, though, where his face is turned towards me, and my face is turned towards him. And, and while you're there in the background, I don't really see all of you. I'm focused in on him. I'm focused in on Brian. And that's, there's that connection, um, in a sense, that, that Katie and I are getting to, and why we love to go there is because um, we're seeing this connection element, And I think this is what's happening with the woman, too. Right? His face is turned towards her. He's zooming into her. And when he zooms into her, everything else fades to the background. She's able to speak in a place she probably wouldn't be able to speak. Right? She, she's given, she's given a, a voice. And what's even more is Jesus is healing. I say Jesus is healing more than just her physical pain. Jesus is healing more than just her physical pain. He, he touches her... her cloak he touches his cloak and she's healed of the hemorrhage but then jesus calls attention to her and he brings her closer right here's someone who lived on the fringes here's someone who lived in the background here's someone who was told for 12 years you have to be far from god but not anymore he's saying you don't have to be far from me be close to me right I'm, let me let me turn my face towards you let me be close to you. And so he's zooming into her, and as he zooms into her, um, he's, he, he is, everything else is blurring into the background. And again, we, we like to point to her faith, and I think it's amazing, but I think what you see Jesus do is he turns this small spark of faith that she has, and he fans it into a flame. Takes a small spark of faith that she has, and he, he's able to fan it into a flame. Here's someone who felt far away, Here's someone who is worried to speak in Jesus' daughter. And she can just exhale. She can just breathe. Well, after she is healed, uh, there's got to be this moment of awkwardness where uh, Jairus is just kind of standing there as all of this happens. Right? And he's, he, he came to him desperate. Um, and he's like, Jesus, why did you stop for, to say, who touched me? There's a giant crowd. Like, what are you doing? But again, Jesus is being intentional. He's zooming into her. He's focusing on her. But he hasn't forgotten about him. And so uh, there's kind of like this transition. Um, just to summarize the rest for you, uh, one of his kind of like assistants comes up and says, hey, you don't, need a, you don't need to bug the teacher anymore. Your daughter's dead. Like, let him go. Let him do his other stuff. It's, it's too late. It's too late. But again, you see Jesus respond in gentleness, respond in humility and say, it's not too late. It's not over yet. She's just asleep. So he goes to the house and he goes in the house and he only lets a select few people in the house. And he goes in there and he tells them, oh, look, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. It's funny to me that that, that line to them is super ridiculous because it says they all start laughing. Um, and it's like, you just watched Jesus heal someone without even literally trying. Like, he literally did not try to heal her. She just touched his cloak, and she was healed. And yet, the idea of him saying she is asleep is just ridiculous to you. Like, I mean, how are you missing it? He doesn't find that ridiculous, though. He takes the girl's hand in gentleness, tells her to wake up, you know, to everyone's amazement, not ours, but to their amazement, she does. She's awake, and, and, and she's back, and, and everyone's filled with, with joy and excitement. They, they, they're, they're changed in that moment, and Jesus says, don't tell anyone, which I always think is interesting. Don't tell anyone. He, he's saying, this is for you. This is for you. It's not for the crowd. This is for you. And I think, again, what we see in that, that this, this story, where it's, it's two stories in one story. It's like Inception. It's a dream within a dream. It's just, you'll, you'll figure, it takes some time, but we'll figure it out. There's this two stories in one story. But what's interesting is Jesus handles them one at a time. He doesn't need to, right? He probably could have just 
done them both real quick at the same time. But he doesn't. He focuses one at a time, and that's this element of the zoomed-in lens. Right? It's not the wide shot with a crowd and, and everyone in there. He's focusing one at a time. And so that kind of brings us to this last little bit, which is, so what? I always like to say this with a student. So what? Like, why, why look at the story? What's the purpose? Is it just to tell the fun story in the Bible? Like, so what? Why, why are we here? What, what's the purpose of it, right? And I think the so what, it comes back to the big idea, right? It comes back to the beginning. Well, a truly impactful life is one of zoomed lenses. It's, it, it's one of a zoomed lens. A truly impactful life is one of a zoomed lens. And so I think that means two things for us. I think that means two things for us today. Number one, Jesus zooms into you. Jesus zooms into you, right? We see from the story, Jesus zooms into this woman. Jesus is zooming into you too. And I think a lot of times we rather stay in the background, right? We rather, we, we think safety um, is, is kind of when God's not thinking about us because then we're not in trouble. And I say, no, no, God, God wants to zoom into you. He wants to turn his face to you. He, he, he wants to be close to you. And I think what we see is, is, is this thing is, well, let him do it, right? Let Jesus zoom into you. If we want to be people who make a difference, if we want to be people who have influence, if we want to be people who have impact, and again, we should, as the church, want to be those people, our starting place is to let Jesus impact us. It has to be the start. Otherwise, we're just skipping a step and everything else will be diluted. And so the, the starting thing is we have to let Jesus zoom into us, and when he zooms into us, everything else blurs into the background. There's this deep breath, this release. And so the first thing is let Jesus zoom into you. A truly impactful life is one of zoom lenses. It starts with zooming in on you. But you're not always just the subject, right? You're not, you're not just the model who gets all their pictures taken and then like, you know, cash your check and your day's over, right? Um, you, you gotta be the photographer every once in a while too. Okay, so if a truly impactful life is one of zoom lenses, not, it starts first with letting Jesus zoom in with you, but then it, it follows to, it's now your turn to zoom into others. If we're following Jesus' example of influence and not uh, the world today, and it means having influence, again, right? We can't just make some TikTok dancing and have some lines of like a Bible verse and be like, yes, we did it, right? Or, or we can't just um, have like a 15 seconds of fame on the news or, or, or anything kind of like that, but we have to zoom in on others. And so what that means is, is kind of this, and, and the challenge that I've had for my students, um, take, take Jesus' example in here. Let's zoom into people one at a time. Let's zoom into people one at a time. Um, and it means a few things. First, um, if you are a photographer, you'll know when you zoom in, um, we'll start with intentionality, right? You've got to pick out where you're going. You've got to be intentional. You've got to choose what you're doing. It's this, the idea, again, of turn your face, right? And be intentional. Also, you'll know that uh, uh, there's focus, right? So blur out the background. Focus in on one. Um, I think too many times we like draw ourselves thin and we're doing too many different things and then because we're doing so many different things we're worried about over here and over here and over here and because of that we don't give any one area really our time or our attention. And so start with one, focus in on one, blur out the background of the distractions, focus in on one. And then finally, which I thought was a really good point, and that my young adult small group came up with, and not even me, was be authentic. Be authentic, right? Don't treat them like a project. Don't treat them like a project. If you treat them like a project, it's just, it's not going to be real. And people can notice that, right? They can, they can see that, and that just, that turns them off. So be authentic. Jesus is clearly not just treating them like a project. You can see his heart in all the ways he responds in all his actions. So, church, as we close out, will you let Jesus zoom into you? Will you let Jesus zoom into you? Will you let him 
turn his face towards you. And as he does, and that, that, that then leads you to take his example, the question becomes, who's your one? Who's your one? Who's your one at a time? Who's your person that you can zoom into? Identify who you can zoom in on. Now, if you notice uh, on your notes, um, the final line, it just says, right, I think it says, like, who can you zoom in on? And it's just a blank. Um, bad news for all of you, there's not a, a fill in the blank. There's not going to be an answer on the screen. Okay, like, sorry um, for those of you who are like, I can't leave until my notes are finished. Well, you're going to have to sit in that seat then and think for a little bit because this part's on you. Okay, I don't get to give you the answer on this one. This part's on you. So the idea is, again, we're leaning into first Jesus, uh, zooming in on us and letting him uh, change us and impact us and influence us. But then we're carrying out his mission, which is to, to share the world about him and, and to, to impact others. And so uh, who's your one? Don't do too much. Don't do too much at a time. We sometimes, a lot of times, we do too much at a time. Who's one? Who's your one at a time? Write it down, because when you put pen to paper, I think it makes it real. There's this reminder like, ooh, I wrote that, and I took it home. And now if I throw it away, it's awkward because it's because I wanted to. Like, you know, so <laughs> there's this intentionality, write it down. And I think what we can see, PCC, is if we take this seriously, we could see next month, next year, at this time, all of a sudden, you got these one at a time people all around us. Last story as we'll close. Um, I was sitting in my youth pastor's office and I noticed um, something called an impact card sitting on um, his whiteboard. And it struck me, I was like, wait a minute, um, what is that? And he explained like this impact card was basically this one at a time where you're writing it down. It's someone who uh, a past student was praying for and a past student wanted to, to, to just share Jesus with. And I was like, that's my leader. That's, the name on that sheet is my high school leader. And so the, um, the reason he kept it and the reason he hung it up is because here's this person who is making a huge impact in our student ministry and in my life, and he was someone else's impact. And so you just see this continuation. So who is your person? Write it down. And then when something amazing happens, now you got the proof too. And you can say, look, look what God's doing. Let's pray. As we pray, I just want to pray this one thing as we close out. Jesus, we pray that you, as you, as you zoom into us, as, as you turn your face to us, God, that that can be something that gives us peace to knowing that, that you want a personal relationship with us, that you want time with us, that you, you are invested in us, God. But God, we pray that as a church, that you can give us eyes for the one, that you can give us eyes for, for the people who need to be zoomed in and on, the people that may be on the fringes, the people um, who may be close to us, the people that, that need to be zoomed on. And so help us to see people the way you see people. We pray this in your name. Amen.